cut to the chase, evidence-based. Pull up a chair, let's get this straight. Peptide buddy, he's your peptide buddy. Hey y'all, today let's revisit elamipertide, better known as SS31. As we hinted at in last year's video, this will certainly be a peptide to keep on the lookout for, because while many peptides have come and gone, this is one modern researcher, some of the best and brightest, are still chasing across multiple diseases tied to mitochondrial dysfunction. And while there are a lot of fad-based scientific topics out there, I don't take mitochondrial health to be one of them. Instead, it's something that seems to be a core feature of many chronic illnesses more so than what one may likely perceive. So as a reminder, SS31 is a tetrapeptide, meaning it consists of four amino acids and it interacts with mitochondria through binding a phospholipid that sits on the inner mitochondrial membrane, and this phospholipid is called cardiolipin. And it binds in such a way that triggers a series of other interactions, which ultimately enhance capacity to generate ATP, or energy source, as well as efficiency of the mitochondrion itself. Now, in different chronic conditions, like in heart failure, for instance, Mitochondrial dysfunction leads to a downward spiral of consequences that further hinder efficient use of ATP and increased calcium levels that can essentially make the mitochondria more permeable, swollen, susceptible to oxidative damage, and ultimately contribute to cellular death. A recently published rodent study based off these optimistic findings that came out of Harvard demonstrated that in aged mice, an eight-week treatment with SS31 resulted in significant improvements in frailty, cardiac strain, diastolic function, and muscle fatigue resistance without detectable change in tissue, epigenetic, or transcriptomic aging. And I wanted to highlight this study because it's recent, has strong academic backing, and gives the peptide a promise to keep investigating. The findings pretty much indicate that there are proposed anti-aging effects that appear detached or uncoupled rather than tied to genetic markers that would indicate features of anti-aging. So, particularly interesting in my opinion. Now let's switch gears a bit and take a look at the multiple clinical trials in humans evaluating use of elamipertide in different chronic conditions. We've talked about multiple of these before, but I think it's worth overviewing here, because we're really going to touch on all of them. And really quick, if you appreciate deep dive, evidence-based breakdowns like this, consider subscribing. It helps the channel grow and keeps this kind of content going. All right, let's get into the data. But first, I really wanted to touch on something here. I think the use case of SS31 is, in a way, a microcosm of the greater peptide space. By that I mean it's a snapshot that represents the difficulty of claiming what these peptides will do in humans. And you'll see in just a moment, rodent research doesn't necessarily translate to humans. Also, when we do finally get the big trials these peptides need, you'll see the results are unclear and oftentimes show us just how little we know about these peptides. And honestly, I know the recent peptide rank list video disappointed many, but in spite of the fact that this is an educational YouTube channel where I just talk your ear off about these different peptides essentially, the very real truth is that even if one works for you or your friend, the data, which is what I spend my time combing through, paints a level of complexity that often doesn't meet the hype. And I get crap for it all the time. But hey, I'm just here to show you what exists and let you interpret it how you will, but I think you'll see what I mean. So the Embrace STEMI trial, whose results came out around 2016. SS31 in this context was labeled MTP131, and it was looked at in patients who had an ST elevation myocardial infarction, a certain type of heart attack. And these people received percutaneous intervention or cardiac stenting. And what researchers noticed was that the size of the infarcted region that lost blood supply in those who received SS31 was no different. However, over the course of 24 hours after the procedure, there was a lower incidence of heart failure within the SS31 group. That said, as time progressed, the incidence was similar to that of the control group who had not received the peptide. Ultimately, this trial was not too promising in the context, at least, of ST-elevated myocardial infarction at this point to justify it becoming a frontline medical intervention for such. The PROGRESS HF trial, or PROGRESS heart failure trial, which was conducted throughout Europe, took a look at use of SS31 in patients suffering from reduced ejection fraction heart failure. 
And although metrics indicating quality of life and mitochondrial function did show enhancement, the primary endpoint looking at function of the left ventricle was unchanged. And although these results aren't too promising since the population of individuals enrolled have a reduced ability to pump blood from the heart, researchers attribute the lack of positive findings in this case to perhaps be due to use of a shorter time frame in which the people were administered the peptide. However, the reported improved quality of life is something that could clinically warrant further workup and investigation. Because at the end of the day, you know, we want to treat more than symptoms. We want to treat quality of life and people's tolerability in general. Next, the RECLAIM trial looked at elamiprotide use in older folks with age-related macular degeneration, a notably terrible ocular condition that can ultimately lead to blindness. The results here were more theoretical than definitive in a way, in the sense that changes in primary markers that would indicate lessened degeneration were not seen. However, there's one part of the eye known as the ellipsoid zone that was seen in those receiving SS31 to degrade more slowly than one may expect. And since this part of the eye is thought to contain greater mitochondrial presence and photoreceptors, it's thought that the peptide could possibly preserve photoreceptor function. However, this idea has not been confirmed with research looking at this in particular, though it does look like a point of future research. The MM Power trials looked at patients with mitochondrial disorders, particularly PMM or primary mitochondrial myopathy, which was confirmed in these cases by genetic testing. These disorders are characterized by mitochondrial dysfunction leading to weakness, poor skeletal muscle development, and exercise intolerance, which seems like an adequate target of the peptide on paper at least. However, the results, although they highlighted that the peptide was well tolerated, didn't meet its targeted endpoints either. Specifically, there was no significant improvement in this six-minute walk test or the primary mitochondrial myopathy symptom assessment, Total fatigue scores after 24 weeks of treatment with elamepertide compared to placebo. However, it did appear that the peptide may have potential benefit for specific genetic subtypes. However, something that's yet to be confirmed and requires further investigation. And while all these trials seem to have trouble meeting their proposed goals, there was a longer one in patients with Barth syndrome called the TAS Power Trial. And what this looked at was a group of patients suffering from a hugely burdensome rare genetic condition linked to a myriad of physical and physiologic issues, high morbidity, and mortality, whose core dysfunction lies in the TAS enzyme, which is involved in cardiolipin remodeling. So something where we can see this peptide playing a distinct and specific role. In these patients, results showed significant improvements in muscle strength, cardiac stroke volume, fatigue scores, and cardiac parameters by the end of 168 weeks. However, the sample size was very small and primary endpoints were not met during this blinded phase, which limits the extent to which we can say the peptide alone contributed to these longer-term noticed results. However, what we can likely say is that this is an area where elamipratide sees promise and one that would quite likely be investigated in children diagnosed with this condition at some point, given the fact that it's so burdensome. This is pretty much the up-to-date on SS31. It's got more research than most peptides we discuss and very specific clinical contexts that are being investigated. And although pretty much every time it seems to not meet the primary endpoint or to prove the main hypothesis researchers seek to evaluate, the more we learn about it, the more we see how multifaceted these compounds truly are, right? All these trials don't show that SS31 should be thrown in the research garbage can. Rather, they highlight that the research angle should be different, which takes a lot of time, money, subjects, and dedicated research teams to navigate. Point being, just because the results aren't as optimistic on paper, the fact that they point to other features to be evaluated and to be learned about is, in my opinion, more promising for getting a well-rounded understanding about how it works and what it'll do long-term, which are things we could only really hope for in this space. Generally, it seems to be well-tolerated. Most side effects are injection site reactions. Sometimes people have allergic reactions. But it's going to be a compound continuously investigated, and I think one whose body of research supports the way I typically try to wrap my head around these peptides. Contrary to somebody who may dive headfirst into their use and say X dose works because Y effect will happen because of mechanism Z, when in reality it's not that simple. And the beauty of it is that it's what we don't know 
that propels further understanding. But at the end of the day, take that with what you will. I'm sorry if this was too sappy for you. But let's wrap things up by summarizing where SS31 stands in research and development. It's apparent that development is being led by a company called Stealth Biotherapeutics. They're investigating SS31 and similar compounds in tons of different conditions and patient populations. So I'm curious to see which direction this research predominantly heads. Check out their website. It'll be in the link of references. It's a pretty fascinating read overall. By the way, before we do finish up, if you're looking for a way to further support the channel, the link to the Patreon will be in the description below. There you can make use of requested videos while either uploaded to the Patreon, the main channel, or both. On top of that, I did recently release a 20-page educational guide on PPC-157 that approaches the data like this video does, a straightforward and concise overview, all sources cited. You'll find that in the description too. But most importantly, thank you for watching. I hope you have a great day and you take care. See ya. Cut to the chase, evidence-based Pull up a chair, let's get this straight Peptide buddy, he's your peptide buddy